Hello, I'm Dr. Joan Kolodzik, National Director of Continuing Medical Education for U.S. Acute Care Solutions. Today I'm going to be talking about lumbar puncture. We're going to talk about the indications, contraindications, complications, equipment, the anatomy, and then the procedure step by step. Today in emergency medicine, the biggest indication for doing lumbar puncture is to rule out meningitis. There really is no other gold standard other than an analysis of the cerebral spinal fluid. Other indications include possibly ruling out subarachnoid hemorrhage. However, the literature is um, not conclusive about this in the days of modern um, uh, digital imaging. So our primary indication still is meningitis. Contraindications for this procedure are very few. However, infection in the overlying tissue is one absolute contraindication. Relative contraindications include increased intracranial pressure, and that might also include the presence of a brain abscess. Of course, when you're in the emergency department, you'll have a lumbar puncture tray with a manometer, collection tubes, prep, analgesia, and a number of other um, things that you need to prepare the area. But for today's presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on the anatomy and the procedure itself. The, the materials that you need are relatively few. It's nice to have some topical lidocaine to anesthetize the area that you're going to penetrate on the skin. And then you need a lumbar puncture needle, which for an adult is usually a 20 or a 22. Children, obviously, would be, very, would be a lot smaller. Let's talk about the anatomy. This is a cadaver specimen who's already been positioned and draped in the sterile fashion in a left lateral decubitus position. Some providers choose to use a sitting upright position to do this procedure, but for the purposes of demonstration, we're going to use the left lateral decubitus position. I'm going to use a tissue marker to highlight the anatomical landmarks that are important. In this position, the iliac crest on the right and on the left are identified by palpating manually. And where it intersects with the spinal column is approximately at about the L3-4 junction. If you want to confirm that you're in the L3-4 intraspinous space, you can palpate inferiorly and feel the sacral promontory. In the adult, a fully grown adult, the spinal column actually ends at about L1, and then it continues to taper inferiorly through the conus medullarum, and then it attaches to the bottom of the sacrum via the phylum terminale. By going well below L1, you're going to avoid any of the major spinal cord structures as well as most of the peripheral nerve structures. The dural space, or the subdural space specifically, happens to be very wide at this area, so the idea is to put the needle into the dural space, draw off some cerebral spinal fluid, and send it to the lab to analyze. The risks of this, this procedure include bleeding, infection, and nerve damage. First of all, bleeding. There aren't any major vascular structures overlying the midline of the lumbar spine at this area, but obviously there are cutaneous venous structures as well as overlying plexus of venous structures on the dura. However, we prevent bleeding by applying pressure after the puncture is completed and asking the patient to lay flat on their back. That addresses bleeding. Infection. This is a sterile procedure. We want to make sure that the, the, the field, the skin, and all surfaces in contact with the procedure are sterile so that we don't actually introduce bacteria into the spinal fluid where, when no bacteria previously existed. The last complication is nerve damage. We prevent nerve damage, again, by going well below the level where the spinal cord terminates and by doing a neuro exam of the lower extremities and the lumbar sacrospine before and after the procedure. Optimal positioning in this position would include knee to chest, but it's not absolutely necessary. Some of the complications that you might experience in an older patient could be inability to access the space because of calcification of the intraspinous ligament, and we'll talk about ways to troubleshoot that by using the lateral approach. So let's demonstrate the procedure. 
Using my spinal needle, I'm going, to, I'm going to angle it so the bevel is facing towards the patient's head, which is in this direction. I'm going to palpate my anatomical landmarks, use a tissue marker if necessary, and I'm going to identify that area where I feel the L3-4 interspinous space is most likely to, to be lying. I may choose to go one spinal level above or one spinal level below. You're still safe in missing most major neurologic structures. I begin by introducing the needle into the intraspinous space. Again, bevel up. I've pre-anesthetized the area with some 1% lidocaine. I've prepped it with betadine, and then I penetrate the skin. Bevel is pointing this direction. I'm, fi I'm 45 degrees off um, the frontal plane, and I'm going to angle towards the area of the umbilicus on the anterior surface. This is a visual tactile procedure. I advise against going too rapidly because you're going to miss the tactile cues that you need to know when you're penetrating the dural space. So I put my fingertips on the tip of the needle, I stabilize the hub of the needle with my thumbs, and I penetrate that intraspinous space. And I go a few millimeters at a time, advancing gradually, and if I hit resistance, then I stop and redirect. When I feel a release of resistance, and I think I might have penetrated the dura, I remove the obturator, and I look for a flow of cerebral spinal fluid. I may or may not get cerebral spinal fluid return with this cadaver specimen, but for the purposes of demonstration, we'll proceed. So I'm going to advance it gradually, and I'm going to penetrate the dura at the midline, just above the level that I've entered the intraspinous space. So I'm going to just check for cerebral spinal fluid. And when I get a return, I'm going to use my collecting vials and collect three or four tubes, approximately three to five cc's, cap it, hand it off to my assistant, and send it to the lab for analysis. After the procedure, you can pull, you return the obturator to the needle, and you can pull the needle out in one swift motion. I usually apply digital pressure to the uh, puncture site for at least a minute to make sure there's no major bleeding. Now, what are some of the complications in older people? Sometimes that intraspinous ligament that very superficial connection between the vertebral spinous processes can calcify and be very hard. And you may not know whether you're trying to penetrate that intraspinous ligament or whether you're butting up against a spinous process. The latter approach to lumbar puncture allows you to access a much broader space just lateral to the spinous processes in which there are no neurovascular structures and very little in the way of calcified ligaments to, um, inter to interfere with your procedure. The benefit of this is that you have a wider space to use, the risk is no greater, and if you're ever in the position in the emergency department where you can't get a lumbar puncture and you call anesthesia or interventional radiology to come down and help you, they are using this lateral approach. So it's using the anatomy to your benefit in order to increase your successful yield on lumbar puncture and obtaining cerebral spinal fluid. So the lateral approach uses your same landmarks. We're still using this L3-4 interspace, but instead of putting my needle in at the midline and staying horizontal or perpendicular to the, the top of the bed, I'm going to come perpendicular and I'm going to come off about a half centimeter to a centimeter off the midline, and I'm going to angle that towards the umbilicus. In doing this, I'm entering, I, I'm avoiding the intraspinous ligament. I am accessing a much wider space that's available to me, but I'm penetrating the dura at the midline at the exact same location that I would have had I done a, a regular midline approach. So again, 
I'm coming off the midline about a centimeter. I'm angling it towards the umbilicus, and I'm going to advance it, avoiding that intraspinous space. Again, very slow, gentle, methodical pushing until you feel that little dural pop. And then you remove your obturator, hopefully get cerebral spinal fluid, collect your specimen, return your obturator, and remove your needle um, in one, one swift movement. The risks of a lateral approach are no different than the risks with a, a midline approach. Um, I've personally found that in my practice, I have a higher yield of successful lumbar punctures. And it might save you an agonizing phone call to get somebody to come down to the emergency department and give you a hand when they may or may not have time to do that. Obviously, the post-procedure -patient, post patient care is the same. We have them lie on their back for an hour. This potentially reduces the risk of, um, of a dural rent or bleeding or um, leaking of the cerebral spinal fluid, which would, could result in a post-spinal tap headache. Always check neurologic function after the procedure. Throw your sharps away, take your drapes and, and clean up your area, and document a good procedure note based on which, which procedure approach you have done. Thank you for listening to this presentation on lumbar puncture.